This week, we interview Phil Young and Chad Rickensrude on the topic of hacking mainframes and their recent DEF CON presentation. Stories of the week will include a Barbie Swiss Army knife, evil Cisco firmware, and some possible ways to give your security team a fighting chance. All that and more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, systems aren't the only things getting penetrated, functions aren't the only things getting wrapped, and bits aren't the only things getting banged. Where are the cocktails flow steady? It's Paul's Security Weekly. This segment is sponsored by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit www.sans.org to learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. Visit them on the web at tenable.com. And brought to you by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. And it's time to fire up a packet capture, pour yourself an adult beverage, and give the intern control of your Bitcoin mining rig. Because here's your host, a man who did not need Ashley Madison to play in Jared's pants, Paul <laughs> Asadorian. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to this edition of Security Weekly. This is, in fact, episode 431, and it's August 20th, 2015. I'm, of course, delighted as always, to be here in studio with a cocktail and, and a pants. cigar and Larry Pesci. Jared's pants. And Jared's pants. <laughs> nice. You could pro- probably fit two children in his pants, I guess. Wow. <laughs> wow. You went. Wow. That's bad. It's a little, a little early in the show, don't you? Is it, a little, is it too early? Is it too early for the Jared jokes? It's never. Too, too soon. Early. Too soon. <laughs> Despicable never human too, being. Never too soon. I never liked him anyway. There was always something fishy about him. <laughs> wow. Anyway, how you doing, Larry? I'm doing all right. Doing all right. It's good. So you got your Sands Pen Test Berlin 2015 shirt on. You know, I, I got to tell you, the Sands Europe guys, the Yemi guys, yeah. know how to do a t-shirt. They this do. is like rock concert t-shirt. Wait, does that mean that the U.S. Sands guys don't know how to do a t-shirt? No, they don't do t-shirts. They do, <laughs> they do polos. polos by request. They do polos. Because people like, I want to wear them to work, and I have to wear a college shirt exactly. to work. Exactly. But, but the, it, they go back and forth, polos or... Call or Enough, t-shirts like and hacker people <coughs> were like we work from home we can wear t-shirts yeah. or not no, oh, I mean I, uh, students like go back and forth I wish it was a t-shirt yeah. not a polo because uh, yeah, yeah, I never yeah, wear yeah, polos yeah. and and <clears throat> do you know how many of those Sans shirts that I have that are identical mm-hmm. all right well Sans is a sponsor so we're gonna move on and introduce Joff <laughs> <laughs> no I mean they're good shirts <laughs> we love, love Sans them. and all uh, the t-shirts I, I, I love them and they supply my wardrobe so that's right. <laughs> What's going on, Joff? You're coming off teaching Sans class. Oh, g'day, Paul. We actually got taught last week, and I'm teaching next week. So this is uh, it's been a uh, a big big month for uh, Sans for me. But I'm I'm getting my uh, my first experience uh, with some of the private engagements, and I hope to be at conference soon. So uh, uh, it's I was, was going to say, oh, they're private engagements, and they're not public ones. Because why haven't we been pimping your stuff? But yeah, yeah, it's a private engagement, but that's okay. Everybody's got to start somewhere, and I'm excited hey, to be doing it. you know, we're it. happy to promote your privates. If oh, <laughs> No, wait, that would be... Wait, that's a different show a altogether. A different show altogether. That would oh, be from you the Polycom Security and Weekly just, porn just studio. Complete, just to completely brag and give out too much information, I had a birthday this week, so it's been a good week. Oh, good. Happy birthday, Joff. Happy well, birthday, Joff. Wow. AARP cards coming your way. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Kill him. Kill him. A <laughs> uh, uh, couple quick announcements before we get started. Purchase Hack Naked t-shirts. You know you want one. And Hack Naked stickers online at shop.securityweekly.com for a limited time only. This is I've, we've never run a discount code of this magnitude magnitude for this length of time. A limited time only. Use the discount code Hack Naked Summer. All one word. All one word. Hack Naked Summer, and get fifty percent off of your order. What? What? That's right. <laughs> what? What? That's right. Fifty percent off of your order. <sighs> Hack right. Naked Summer. It's a summer blowout. Damn. 
I was waiting for you to come another term blowout, but damn. When, when you said that, when you said that, Paul, I, I, I kept thinking hack naked summer glow, but it's a hack naked that. summer blowout. I should have made the discount code summer, like a h summer. It's summer. summer. It's summertime here in New England. We like got clams. We parked the car. Park the car. <laughs> I always have, have a blowout with my clams. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Clams will do that I'm to not, you. I don't want to talk about Larry's clams. <laughs> so this hack naked summer blowout, but summer is spelled E-R, not it's hack naked summer. Uh, it ends on September 23rd, 2015, which is the last day of summer, first, first day, of, day fall. of fall, something like that. Yeah, uh, whatever. I think it's, it's the first day of fall. Day. Yeah. So it's good up until that date. So hack naked summer, 50% off shop.securityweekly.com. Boom. Go there now. Uh, I think the stickers are going to stay up there for a while. We might leave them up. Yeah. Uh, there's a limited quantity right now. However, we're going to order a lot more. And by a lot, I mean like 10,000 more. Like and, a lot. Oh, I did have one update to the design. More Remind nip- me in between segments or something. I'll tell you what it more is. More nipples. So we are going to do a limited amount of the nipple logo on the sticker. I may reserve those for like us to give out at conferences. Like I may just give them to everyone who's affiliated with the show, and it can be like your own personal. Like you can't buy these, you can't get them anywhere else. Like you got to come see one of us on Security Weekly to get them. But there will be a hack naked nipple logo sticker. Nice. Is, is, is this where we get to talk about our geek mother issues? A logo, again? a logo nipple sticker, a nipple logo <laughs> sticker, something like that. I, I like the nipples. I don't know why it's stuck in my head. <laughs> You do like the nipples. Okay. How can you not? Larry's teaching Sands 617 wireless, wireless even, ethical hacking and defense coming up in Las Vegas. You're going back to Vegas, dude. Vegas. For the 14th going through the 19th. Going back to Vegas. Going to back Vegas. to Vegas. To Vegas. It sounds like yes. a country song or something. I don't think so. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, back to Vegas uh, just in a couple of weeks. Yep, and then uh, Pentest Hack Fest uh, later this year in Good. Washington, D.C. That'll be lots of fun. Nice. Um, I'm speaking at the Pentest Hackfest as well. What are you speaking about there? Uh, I'm going to do the same talk that I'm doing at DerbyCon, because it's a completely different audience. Um, and that's, uh, the title of the talk at DerbyCon is All My Password Cracking Brings the Boys to the Yard. <laughs> <laughs> Love the title. It's an excellent. Larry. That may be the best title you've come up with yet. Yeah. Wait till you see slide number two. I'll show you. I'll show you slide number two. It's yes. nice. it's awesome. Put, two, putting the awesome. Asadorian in class. <laughs> right. I would like to welcome our special guest to the show, uh, Chad Rickensrud, aka Big Endian Smalls. I love that nickname. <laughs> <laughs> has been making breaking programming networking computers since Google was Gopher and AOL trial CDs were more than just hipster coasters. Currently, he leads a technology department at a large financial institution and is charged with all those corporate things. And they use the word enterprise. And all those corporate things. That's uh, awesome. Recently, he's teamed up with Phil, the soldier of Fortran Young, to develop a serious penetration testing methodology and tool set for the framework. And educate and recruit for people. For the mainframe. What did Not I the say? Framework. Oh, mainframe framework. For the mainframe work. Close enough. Larry, come on now. Chad spoke on this topic with Phil at the most recent DEF CON and is giving another talk about mainframe security coming up at DerbyCon 5.0. And, of course, we welcome back Phil Young to the show, who is also known as the soldier of Fortran, uh, mainframe security researcher and pen tester who works full-time Testing mainframes and their security. He's spoken about mainframe security on Security Weekly, Black Hat, DEF CON, ShmooCon, B-Size, Las Vegas, and others. In his spare time, he also runs the Internet Mainframe Project, dedicated to finding cool TN3270 screens on the Internet, which is, if there was ever a geeky hobby, that would be it, <laughs> Phil. Wow, well, yeah, um, that definitely goes into the obscure. That right puts there. you like in the nerd category, dude. Um, so Phil's developed multiple tools, tools for platforms uh, that he's built into Nmap that we'll talk about and get into on the show. So Phil and Chad, welcome to Security Weekly. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Paul. Yes. Glad yeah. to be here. Nice to, to have you guys here. Um, Phil, you've been on the show before, so yep. I'm going to start with Chad and ask Chad how he got to start in information security. Yeah, I'd say... Well, I, I, I've been doing technology since I was, you know, like just out of the womb, I think. But security probably, uh, 
Uh, I'm a relative relative newcomer to security, maybe only in the last decade. And I actually got into it when I had a, a friend of mine send me a link to a online uh, uh, one of those kind of like security challenges type thing, where, where basically they give you a packet capture and they ask you a bunch of questions about it, and you have your time. Like, how quickly can you find out? Like, what were the creds of the guy that was trying to connect to the SMB share? What was his name? All these kinds of things, right? And you have to go through a packet capture. It's like a forensics kind of challenge. Somebody sent me that, and I um, I did really well on it. And uh, I, I live in Minnesota, and I won it at our state level, which I don't know. It's probably me and, like, one other guy. And um, <laughs> But that was it. It was, kind of, it was, it was me. It was one of the guys. It was a tie, really. But, you know. It was a tie, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was actually – I used both, two different usernames. Then I just did, didn't do as well in the other one. But <laughs> – <laughs> yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. I, just, I was like, "Wow, this is great." I mean, I always I've always kind of like how things work and breaking them, taking them apart, you know, that kind of stuff. So, for me, having done network administration development, you know, all the other stuff that you know you cut your teeth on along the way, this is the next logical step for me because I wasn't happy until I knew exactly what was happening at the ones and zeros and bits and bytes level. So it, it kind of security was a like a logical next step. So, Chad, what what got you started in, in being interested in mainframe security? Yeah, um, what got me started in mainframe was actually just a, was just a was an interesting job. I ran data center operations uh, for a number of years at the, the same company I'm at, and one of those was mainframe. Part of that was mainframe operations. I don't really know much about mainframes at that. <clears throat> never really signed on to it. And then I started realizing that they were not not only not only uh, still very viable, but really cool. Like, I mean, the, if you're a, if you're a if techno nerd and you love it, you know, technology for what it can do and scale, and you know, uh, th- there's really very little that's that's more powerful or cooler than than one of these systems. So I kind of fell in love with the platform. And then from the security side of it, I, I realized uh, I don't know. I, I woke up in a cold sweat about you know a year and a half ago, and I was like. Shit, who's pen testing the mainframes, right? And I, and I basically, I Googled it, and it was like Phil's name was the only one came up, really. <laughs> uh, I was like, great, there's one other guy, perfect, we're saved. Um, Everything's so, going to be all right. At least we have Phil. <laughs> and, and Thank that, God so, for like, Phil. Oh, shit, now what? No, I'm just kidding. But it was like, so, you know, I was really worried about, um, I really became worried about it from a uh, from a perspective of like I wanted a niche, something I could really sink my teeth into, that not a million other people were doing, and I needed it to be important. Like I couldn't just do it for the sake of doing it. I'm not motivated by doing busy work. You know, I needed something I could kind of believe in, and and understanding what I do about mainframes and what they're at the core of, like governments and financial organizations and airlines and you know important stuff. Um, that just kind of put it all together. I'm like, well, nobody's hacking these things. You don't read about them in the news. Uh, I think it's just because, A, they're obscure. You know, not everybody has one. You can't download one. Nobody's got them in their basements. Most people don't have them in their basements. Um, now, now and, wait, Chad. Uh, I, I want to stop you there. Um, so, uh, Chad and Phil, I don't remember from the last time that Phil was on, do you virtualize the ZOS operating system? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I th- last time I, yeah. I couldn't remember what you said last time. I should have gone back and listened to it, but it's okay. Uh, I don't remember either, so it works. <clears throat> yeah. So you don't have to have a mainframe in your basement to go back to Chad's point. You can virtualize it. No, you can virtualize it. But to me, the mainframe is really the software, yeah. right? I, that's what it is to me. Well, I'm sure your mainframe guys would be very disappointed that you kind of downplaying the hardware aspect of that, Phil. <laughs> I don't have mainframe guys, so that works out pretty good for that's me. Good, that's good. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Excellent. Um, so, what do you virtualize it with? Is the uh, uh, what what software are you using to virtualize? Kimu. Okay, so so IBM has a product that it's changed. Actually, since the last time I was on, it's changed product names three times. So, yeah, IBM does that a lot. My friend yeah. works for IBM. Yeah. He's always um, like, so- yeah. I'm selling this product, and then he's like, well, that product's a different name, and now I'm on this other product, and they put it in the cloud, so they're calling it a different thing, and yeah. yeah. So it used to be called, like, ZPDT, and then it was called Rational Developer for System Z and Unit Testing, and now they, then they called it RD and Z, and now they're calling it RD and T. So I think if you just look for, like, IBM RDT, you might find it. Okay. But other people, the problem is, so if you work for a large enterprise and you're interested in getting into this, you likely have access to this licensed product for, for free or for cheap. And 
you're going to have to figure out what your enterprise calls it. So call up your IBM rep and figure it out. Um, you can also emulate like a public domain mainframe with a uh, with a product called Hercules. It's an open source mm -hmm. Z architecture emulator. So okay. you can do that. <clears throat> so emulate. it's like a custom a custom fork of Zen to be able to emulate the ZOS. It's like its own thing. It's, oh, like it's a own hypervisor. It's an open source hypervisor. I gotcha. That, that basically emulates Z hardware. So if you can, you know, there are some public domain versions of of uh, of the MVS or whatever you could run on it. Um, Is that know, well, was that developed in collaboration with IBM or does like some guy like, hey, I got a lot of spare time at my day job, so I'm yeah. gonna write an emulator for COS hardware. The story goes. The story I've been told is it's an it's it's a guy that had had worked at IBM or had knowledge about the architecture and went and wrote it. Wow. With That's... with the intent of turning it into a product that people could use to move away from the mainframe hardware. I gotcha. And then and then got sued in Europe and now it's open source. Uh, <laughs> and, okay, well that oh, makes sense. Man, bummer. If you're aware of a breach that happened in Sweden with a mainframe, the guy was using a really old ver like not not public domain but an older version of the operating system called ZOS to run on Hercules. So we know it works mm -hmm. to run the mainframe operating system. Nice. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Are there any uh, limitations of any significance? For both, I mean, just just the, the volumes, like the size of the disk images are in, there's no compression, especially for the IBM product. Mm -hmm. There's no compression, so it's like, I was talking to our guy, I need, I need 100 plus gigs just to store the hard drive images mm -hmm. to be able to emulate. That doesn't include the RAM, and, and it uses a lot of RAM. Anyway, it's fine. It runs fast enough. Mm -hmm. the, other, be, the, only other, the only other limitations are, like every other hypervisor, once you start to get out into the real world, you know, so it's great for running programs and learning the OS, but when you need it to connect to something else. I got you. you know, yeah, so it, it oh, doesn't yeah. do that. It emulates everything. There's no, you know... Uh, you you can't connect it to anything else. It, so once you start to get past that level, you know it doesn't really it really breaks down. But just for learning it, for developing it, you know that kind of stuff, it's perfect. It works really well. Now, it, this obviously uh, mainframes have been around for a long time, uh, longer than most modern operating systems today. And as time has gone on, certainly there must be a lot of CVEs that have accumulated for the Z. Am I not? No. How yeah, many, I, no, there's got to be a lot, lot right? Them, but nobody knows. Um, I know, they're not public. I know of I know of three, but they're not technically z mainframe operating system vulnerabilities. They are products that run on the mainframe that happen to come with the mainframe <laughs> that come with but, vulnerabilities. <laughs> come yeah. with vulnerabilities. Okay. And, <laughs> and, and those were published like because WordPress the Danish government forced IBM to publish them. But, oh. but. Other than that, it's it's not. There are no known publicly released vulnerabilities for the platform. E, is that so? Do like does IBM send in like their ninja lawyers if if someone tries to do that, or like what's the reason for that? Or does no one well, really that anybody honestly? I don't know that anybody's tried to do it. Frankly, I mean, yeah. basically, what 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 they'll tell you. I mean, so they have a so IBM has a security portal uh, that their customers can can get access to where they will, and this is fairly recent, they will let the customers know, hey, there's a security vulnerability. Uh, it's a high ranking, you know, they'll give it a score, uh, but they don't give them a, they, and they give them a kind of a general vector, right? Like it's network or it's uh, whatever, but they don't give them a proof of concept. It's not explicit, you know, what is actually broken. And then it's up to the customer whether they want to apply it or not. I mean, you have to understand the, the mainframe is a closed ecosystem. So mm -hmm. you can't get it anywhere except from them. So they know who, you know, on, in theory, right, they know who all their customers are. So they can reach out to every one of their customers and say, you need to put this on, this is important or not, or whatever. And their customers just then can decide whether or not they, they want to put it on. But they don't disclose any of that any of that publicly. And, and most, most organizations that have a mainframe will keep it under support, right, if they're actively using it. Have to. It's probably important <laughs> enough that they're going to keep it under support. If they want to, it's up to it's up to their discretion to install the patches. Mm -hmm. The other yeah. challenge is is um, so I'll use an example. It's my favorite example. So when that breach in Sweden happened, there was like a pretty brutal zero day, and 
it was so bad that IBM was calling people up Christmas Eve to install the patch. Wow. <laughs> right? It was sort of the genesis. And there was a mailing list of people talking about it, this super secret patch they were talking about it on a mailing list. And one person said, um, I will install, I've already installed it in our test environment. And in six months, it will migrate into production. <laughs> Woo! Six okay. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. So is, it, is, is that just an operational thing for them? Or is Probably. the patching process that painful on no. that platform? I would think not, because a lot of it's based on virtualization. Yeah. So I would it imagine that allows for a pretty easy patching process, right? The p patching process isn't hard in and of itself. It, what it has to do with is... It, you plug your ears because I'm going to use corporate words, but it's like enterprise <laughs> risk, right? <laughs> you know, so it's like if Damn. this is, you know, if this is like your heart, right, or your or your brains or something like that, you're not going to just I'm like, gonna... well, I'm not feeling too good. I got to have a bypass. Why don't we just quick do that, like right after lunch, you know, and then we're going to get out of here. It's kind of like you you want to test it. You want to make sure it's good. You want to make sure you're you don't have any outages in the process oh. and so on and so forth. So well, wait, wait, six months you, is a little ridiculous. Can't part. you just do that on the hardware that's in QA? Oh, Yo, wait, yeah. wait, never mind, never mind. <laughs> well, I, but to speak to your point, Larry, and you guys are the experts in this area, um, the mainframe platforms, as they evolved over time, even earlier on, were very much based on virtualization technology. It was kind of like the it's amazing foundations of yeah, full everything comes come. full circle, right? Oh, so yeah. I would think if you have a lot of that virtualization technology in your mainframe platform that you could... That would ease patching, so I could apply it to this section and then revert absolutely. more easily, right? Is that the absolutely. case? That's the that's case, what they right? do. Mm -hmm. and, and enterprises yeah. do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Enterprises yeah. do that to mitigate risk, right? Yeah. Prevent APT. I get it. And yeah. cyber. Ass assuming that it... <laughs> 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 uh, 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 yeah. I think they're, they're, they're cyber risk. They're right. cyber, cyber risk. risk. Yes. Yeah. They mitigate their cyber uh, risk. When I was younger, I had no risk of cyber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was a geek even none on the internet. The, none I mean, of the, I was, none I was, of the people who pretending to be women online would talk to you. Nope, I get it. No, nope, I get it. <laughs> yeah, not even on AOL. <laughs> uh, hey, some people still use that. Now AOL we've gotten thing. way off track. <laughs> <laughs> ASL. So cyber uh, risk. It's well, all around. Uh, along these lines, I mean, uh, uh, there are no CVEs. We've made it clear that the, the the patching process people don't understand the importance of applying a security update. So, I mean, does IBM just not want it leaked out of their ecosystem? Is it a publicity thing for them? Do customers no. not care? Like, why? What, what? Where is the disconnect between IBM mainframe uh, ZOS secure and security? Yeah, so Chad and I are both passionate about this specific thing. I'll, I'll say my piece and let Chad say his. Uh, my theory has always been uh, no one's doing the research. So, okay. so, I mean, you've got two of maybe the five people in the world who do this on the show, right? So you've got a good percentage of the, the people doing this kind of work. And because there's not that Watch many people that doing this. Oh. <laughs> yeah. There might be security stuff, and people who work at corporate enterprises, they just tell it to IBM, and that's where it goes, and that's where it dies. They don't have the, the concept of responsible disclosure mm -hmm. in terms of like making sure that people... You know, well, also, you know, they found a bug, they reported it to IBM, it got fixed. They may not even know that it was a security bug. Mm -hmm. you know? mm. And then IBM might. IBM will and say, hey, you need to install this patch, it's important. But other than that, that's sort of where it goes. And then uh, I'll let Chad go from there. Yeah, my everything Phil said, and then I, you know, I'd say that um, the disconnect that I, I think that I feel like is missing, you know, you know, people inside IBM are testing the crap out of this, and the platform is a very secure platform configured correctly. But you could say that about Linux and Windows and everything, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and and I don't think that the, you know, I think that IBM probably has the best and brightest developers, like like Windows or Apple or Google does, and they still find. Zero days in their products, despite having a user base that's ten hundred thousand times bigger than, than the mainframe. So it just stands to reason that they have to be out there. Um, their their, I think their customer base still lives in the in the ages where they don't want it disclosed because they believe there's some security in that. But but my argument, and and I kind of get that. But my argument is, look, you have to assume the bad guys. You have to assume that the bad guys 
have access to these things, right? You have to assume that Iran or Russia or China have a mainframe. If they didn't buy it directly from IBM, they bought it on the secondary market. Mm -hmm. You have to assume they have access to it. Uh, they're, they're reverse engineering it, finding bugs, whatever. They're definitely not reporting them. Um, so it's kind of like you're building up your army on one side and not on the other because you don't, you're not, you're not um, actively encouraging the, the the white hat guys, if you will, to do the same thing, right? And you're not, and you're not doing, uh, you're not giving away your hypervisor, right? Like that's, you know, you're not encouraging people right out of college to download it and play with it or put it on the internet and say, hey, hack me, you know, let's let's go at it. What can yeah, you do? You don't. Like, you, so, do you ever see a day where IBM introduces a bug bounty program for this platform? I think. You know, I don't know. What do you what do you, what do you think, Phil? I, I probably not not until the other vendors do it. That's my my personal thinking is is the other big vendors in this space prop will have to do it first before IBM does. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But I think one of two things will have to happen. Either there'll be a huge enough breach where the where the government will step in and basically, you know, be heavy handed with them. Yeah, make Maybe them not do bug it. bounty, but public disclosure. Mm -hmm. Or their customers will want it, right? Because ultimately they're, you know, they're gonna do what their customers want them to do. You get enough of a groundswell and their customer says, Hey, you need to treat us like Microsoft treats us or like anybody else treats us, where you know, you are very forward with the bugs, or if our people find one, you give us recognition for it or mm. bounty for the researchers or whatever. But I think it's gonna have to the impetus is gonna have to come from somewhere else. There's no impetus for them to change right now. Yeah. Yeah, I've taken a one eighty on the well not so much a one eighty. But I've I've had a turnaround on bug bounties. I really think they're I think they're a positive thing. It sounds like this is a prime candidate to motivate researchers to go find bugs and disclose them responsibly. It almost mm. sounds like now that <laughs> now we've got to convince other nation states ABI are probably BM. yeah other nation states are probably most incentivized to find bugs in this platform, which really really worries me. Katie Misser is new client. That's right. <laughs> if, if your country will rely on mainframes for all of its banking and all of its critical infrastructure. It would behoove you. To learn how to hack it, so you could take that and use that against other countries. Mm -hmm. right. right. So, how how old are some of the protocols and associated books and manuals that uh, you guys referenced in your DefCon talk? But like, I just put it in perspective for our listeners. Like, how old is some of that uh, material? Right. I'll go and then and then Chad because Chad's books are way older than my books. So I, I was using um, actually I just cleaned out my folder that I was that I was keeping some of these PDFs in. And the oldest I could find was like 1980 something, the mid 80s. Definitely, it was for uh, it was the SNA Programmer's Handbook or something like that. Mm. And it was, yeah, but a lot of these are really old. It's not just because that's when the protocols were created, and they haven't seen much much change over the years. I mean, how much change has Telnet mm. really seen in terms of the protocol? Right? Not not much at all. None. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Right, so so for me, and that's on the networking side specifically because that's where I sort of come from. All of those books were all published in the '80s. They're free. I just get them off as PDFs, 300-page book. That's about it. That's the oldest I've got. But Chad, Chad's got me beat by a couple of years. Yeah, when I was doing some of the research on how the uh, how the process, because it's a different processor, so how the processor works and uh, some of the ass the assembly language for that processor. One of the answers I found just, you know, like you do and go out and Google it. And the first manual I found was written in 1965. Wow. Good it was God. printed out, you know, presumably on a great big IBM printer. And then somebody eventually scanned it into a PDF and put it online. Um, but, the you know, the ages of the protocols themselves, what's so great about it is stuff that was written back then can still run on a current architecture. But it also has everything on it that's very new and you know, it's got you, you can run IPsec and uh, you know TLS, and it's got encryption instructions built into the CPU. So there's no there's no lack there's no datedness in the platform, except that it's very very good at running things that have been around for you know it's very very backward compatible. And that's its virtualization architecture that allows for that, right? Yeah, the virtualization and the fact that I think that the core that that, that everything they've added onto it, they've regression tested. And because they don't have to deal with anybody else about it, right? I mean, they they own the mm -hmm. they they build the hardware, they build the OS, they build all the core applications, they write the microcode for the hardware. I mean, you know, it, it's pretty easy to keep it a nice tight ecosystem. We don't I have see. to deal with anybody else's stuff, right? Right. 
Yep. <clears throat> don't have to worry about the whole having to throttle back your processor and do all sorts of weird virtualization stuff so you can get your copy of Carmageddon 2 to run under right. <laughs> Windows 7 on a processor that's about a billion times faster than the right, original. Right, we have to click it into, like, DOS mode. Remember that in Windows that's 95? Right. Yeah. I had to do. DOS, mode. DOS mode. Yeah. mode. Yeah. Okay. That was awesome. Yeah. We used to play Doom all the time like that. Right. Yeah, serial yeah. cable. Serial cable. See, I used to play Doom over the serial we cable. We had serial cable run between two dorm rooms in our dorm. Yeah. My cousin <laughs> used to then use the phone lines because he'd be like, oh, I can't, I can't get my mom to take me over to your house. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Ma, don't pick up the phone because you'll disrupt our Doom game. <laughs> <laughs> that was yeah. awesome. Um so now, certainly in today's day and age, when you perform, uh, use modern assessment tools, certainly over the years, these tools have picked up, like Nmap must know how to scan a mainframe. No, Phil's laughing. Yeah. Phil's laughing at me now. <laughs> so, so I gave a talk at Sky Talks, and if you missed it, you missed out because it was a good talk, uh, mm -hmm. about finding and hunting mainframes on the internet. And one of the things I did is I, I was like manually using Google to find documents that reference mainframes, and then I would find them on the internet, and I'd scan them with Nmap. And the highest, the number one item that came out in like what it thought the service was was Microsoft IIS SSL. Wow. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, that's kind of messed up. Not only that, but even when it does identify it properly, Nmap, and don't get me wrong, Nmap, great tool, I use it all the time, nonstop. But it identified the uh, operating system as OS390, which the 90s stands for 1990s, and that's the last time the operating system was released, and it was end of life in the 90s, and nobody's running it anymore, right? Like it's, because of its closed ecosystem, nobody's running OS390 anymore. It's all uh, ZOS. They, they transitioned from like, OS390 to ZOS, right? Everybody has been moved off. Mm -hmm. and uh, But... Nmap will still tell you it's OS 390. And I tried to get it changed to ZOS, and the reply I got back was, well, someone could run OS 390 someday, so submit it through the normal process. And once we get enough submissions, we'll update it and add that as the operating system. And I said, I'm the only guy who's got these signatures. I'm the only one doing this. <laughs> I'm just going to have to do it like 100,000 times by myself. Right, right. So, right. so yeah. So, it's, so instead of doing that, I wrote That's what my wife tells me anyway. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I made Not a much. funny. That's Same. what she told me too. I have to inject some humor into this because this is pretty depressing, Phil. <laughs> to be honest with you, <laughs> like it's but well, you're making it sound like like you guys are the only uh, like you're two of five guys and you guys are the five guys or gals in the world that care about mainframe security enough to do the research. At least publicly talking about it, right? I mean, yeah. Who, if you if you search for people publicly talking about it, it's us two, Dominic White and Mark Wilson, and, uh, and there's a couple other people at mainframe conferences that talk about like the security. But they're like you know, and they're great talks. And if you have a chance to go to share, I please please go if you're interested. But it it's for it's mainframe talks for mainframe people. It's not like here's how you run Nmap to do this type of attack, and here's how you use Metasploit to do this type of attack. It's very specific to the platform. Is so it, are you is saying that's niche? Is that what you're saying? It's niche. <laughs> you know, everybody, everybody who uses this platform, present company excluded, is is focused on making it do what it does as as well as it possibly can, hmm. right? It's like they've spent their whole lives and everything that they do is about like how can we squeeze the last bit of performance out of this thing, but but nobody is like, well, what happens if we punch it in the stomach and kick it in the head? You know, like. They're not yeah, thinking about yeah, that. You don't yeah. want that to happen, right? You want it right. to, you want it to sing and purr, right? Nobody's going that down was, that. That was my experience at the university where I worked, where we had a mainframe, and I was the security guy, and I was like, "Wow, all the are like really, really sensitive stuff in our major applications that support the entire infrastructure that makes this university run. I'm like a lot of those run on our mainframe, and you have the security discussion with the mainframe people, and they're like." They don't. They're not that they don't get it, but they're like they've never looked at it from that angle before. They're like, they can't get over from what you were saying, Chad. Of, like, we got to make it work because it's so critical to the business. Like, our our goal is to, we need to make it work and work as efficiently as possible. And we've never thought about it from the. I like your analogy of like, well, let's punch it in the stomach and see what happens. 
right? It's like basic, you know, basic fuzzing or basic like destructive testing, right? In security is a, nobody even bats an eye when you talk about that kind of stuff anymore, I guess. Well, unless you're Oracle, but that's a different story for another day. But, mm. uh, <laughs> you know, like nobody even thinks about that anymore. It's just kind of considered part of the part of the process. And, it, it, and they do talk about configuring it well. I mean, it's a very secure system. And there yes. are a lot of people talking about how you configure it well. But there's right. configuration. And then there's out going out looking for trouble, right? Yep. And they're different things. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Because they would always talk to me about, oh, God, you're stretching my nose. R, was it RBAC? Is that what it's called? RAC F. RAC F. Thank you. Thank you. RAC F. Right. Tell us more about RBAC. Yeah, yeah. yeah what is our back? I don't know. I just made that up. <laughs> I don't, our back. That's usually where he blows his. Wait, never mind. <laughs> that's oh, Larry. That's role-based access control. Role-based yeah. access control. But Rack F is kind of the same thing, right? Back me I up. I mean, here. yeah, basically, it okay. stands for a resource access control facility. See, but I wasn't. No. I was. Slow. No, I was yep. in the same <laughs> ballpark you anyway. Are. I was a totally different sport. Yeah, yeah, same close ballpark. Enough. Yeah. Well. Part of the reason I do I st- got started was because I guaranteed the mainframe you worked on and the mainframe every, all the listeners who have a mainframe work on their auditor they're, they're relying on the auditors coming in and saying oh we had auditors come in so it's safe it's secure yeah right yeah and they just I, told I, the I auditor really like I restricted this user to do this yeah and but that user can't do this only these users can do that and the auditor was like wow. You configured your rack F correctly, and you had R back, and so you passed your audit. Yeah, yeah. I used to be that auditor. I used to be that guy who had that checklist and was like, okay, show me what an exit is. Okay, good. Next. You have those, right? And so, and once I started digging in the platform more and started understanding what was going on and sort of the disconnect between the security culture and the mainframe culture that exists, Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, it's bad. It, why is it this bad? How come no one's talking about it? And no one was talking about it, and that's why I started talking about it. And there's, like, even at the most recent share I was at, there was an extensive discussion about the difference between compl- security based on compliance and security based on all the other activities you can perform. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there was, this big, there was this big disconnect between, well, we're compliant, and there, so therefore we're secure. And I have to say, like, well, Target was compliant. Home Depot was compliant, right? Like, it's it's not just about compliance, and there was, and it's still a challenge in that space. So, recently, and in, in, uh, now, Chad, were you involved with the Nmap scripting project that Phil? Would you guys work on that together? Yeah, oh, that no. was all it's Phil's. Way cooler. I'll let him talk about. Yeah, it. that that was that was all that was all Phil stuff. He he is the uh, he is the Nmap and network tool slash ASCII art generator guy. Okay, and now, so which <laughs> what, so which aspect of the project did you work on, Chad? Uh, this, what I what I worked on was what I set out to do because I found I knew what Phil was doing. I was like, look, what I want to start doing is dispelling some of the myths that are like widely held outside of IBM. Like, uh, you know, you can't have a you can't have an exploit. You can't do a buffer overflow. The the system won't allow it. Right. Like those kinds of things don't work on a mainframe. You don't need to worry about that kind of stuff. So what I set out very Wait, specific. People really thought that. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. Absolutely. People still think that, that that you can't do that kind of stuff on a mainframe, um, but yeah. So I so I kind of sat out to like, well, you know, one at a time, we're going to start disproving these things, and then also the learning curve is steep for for anybody who hasn't been involved in this. It, it's really steep. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, so part of our releasing tool sets is to get people to where they need to be quicker than right. than it took us, you know, to get to where we are. In terms of understanding, which is probably just a you know the tip of the iceberg, really. But um, so my part of the project for this for this DefCon talk was basically I, I built a vulnerable C application, which would be a, a garden variety vulnerability that was susceptible to a buffer overflow, and and then proved that you could overflow it, write shell code, get a shell, all that kind of stuff on a, on a mainframe. If you know how to do it in Linux or if you know how to do it in Windows, it's the same thing, just a different set of instructions but it yeah so did you have a disassembler and or debugger to help you with the process yeah there's a so i did this project intentionally using only the tools that came that come on the mainframe right i Mm -hmm. I didn't port anything to it or bring anything extra so there is a debugger if you know what gdb is Mm -hmm. in linux there's one uh it's called dbx 
Uh, and it's similar enough to G- GDB. I tell people if you like G- if you like GDB, you'll probably hate DBX. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's similar enough, but it, it works like GDB. So you can check the registers, you can check and edit memory, you can you know single step the the uh, uh, assembly instructions and that sort of stuff. So yeah, that's without that, this would have been pretty near impossible because the system there aren't any tools on the system set up for disassem you know de- uh, disassembly that kind of stuff like destructive testing. It's all about building things, right? Mm-hmm. So we're working to change that. Um, that's that's one of the things on the short list is getting a better tool set for for working with it so you got, are you going to write your own debugger now i'm going to i'm going to port uh with some with the help of some other folks i'm going to port the uh radar framework yes I'm yeah familiar with that yeah so i, I had a great talk <clears throat> at defcon with one of the guys that does a lot of development and training on that platform mm-hmm. and it's all c based there are really no uh, requirements it just you know it's all written from scratch so um, defining the architecture and platform to it will be the biggest hurdle, but then that will be that will be a huge leap forward in, yeah. in disassembly and debugging and stuff. On yeah, the I was going to say that that's one of the open source disassemblers debuggers that uh, are frequently talked about and has a lot of support behind. So yeah, yeah, and and the other thing is just to give a little bit of a a little bit of a, a teaser of what I'm going to talk about at Derby is. Um, so when people go out and start finding things, they need to have something to do with it. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm working on building modules for Metasploit that can, you know, like the basic stuff, right? Like bind shells, reverse shells, uh, EXEC payloads, that kind of stuff. So that if you do find something and you want to test it out or prove it out or show the boss what you did, right? You have a way of doing that so that people are in pen testing companies or do this for a living or own mainframes have a means like everybody else and something they understand, not a you know archaic tool set of doing it. Yeah, so were there, um, did you, you must have had to build your own payload, right? I mean, because you can't go into Metasploit yeah. and pull a payload out. Like, oh, no. The payload no, is gotta, very specific to the processor architecture. So. Yes, absolutely. Very specific. To pro- it's a different a CPU, uh, totally different assembly instructions. There are thousands of assembly instructions. Mm-hmm. And, and the kicker, which makes all this really hard, is it's not an ASCII-based platform. It's an EBCDIC. So it's a right, right. Oh, sh- so well, even you- your even your payload has to be EBCDIC. Uh, the instructions and commands at a right. certain level have to be encoded with EBCDIC, right. not ASCII. Right. If, you, if you put a Netcat listener on the mainframe and you connect to it from your PC and you start typing, you have garbage on one end and you start typing garbage on the other mm. because it's not doing that translation. So when you do the... When you do the payload, it's not just as easy as execing and popping a shell because you have to translate all the bytes in and translate all the bytes out. Wow. Snap. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the what is the processor architecture? It's a Z it's Z architecture, it's proprietary. Mm-hmm. Um, it has uh, it's kind of neat. It, it it's a 24, 31, and 64 bit modes on there. So you can actually wow. Uh, unlike unlike other OSs that are either 64-bit or 32, you can compile and run programs in any one of those modes on the same OS on the same processor, and it basically the OS takes care of obfuscating the registers. So a 31-bit program only thinks they're 31-bit registers. Um, uh, okay. There's uh, 48 different registers, thousands of instructions. Um, the other really interesting one that you have to work around is uh, it has something called uh, memory key protection. So Every 4K of memory has a has a, a few bits that are a key, and every instruction also has a key, and they match those keys up when you try to read or write from memory to see if the that instruction is authorized to read or write from that particular chunk of memory. Hmm. That happens at the CPU level, so you can get shut down immediately if you try to read or write to some memory that you don't have access to. It's pretty good. Sounds like some lessons could be learned here. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of yeah. Yeah. well. Your your expo- your payload would be executing the same context of the process that would have the key for that area of memory it's already assigned to. So yeah. it doesn't I mean, necessarily help with exploitation, right? It, yeah, you're you're exactly right, Paul. Like if you can't get it done in four thousand bytes, you should not be writing shell. <laughs> <laughs> This is but very then, true. then you know your hope is that you get a process because it works like kind of like Linux. Like you hope you get a process that has some security associated with it that you then inherit, right? Like mm-hmm. the process is special, uh, root, a root process or an authorized process that then you can you know, pivot off of. Or all the other ways, like maybe you're just, you know, get somebody to install some software for you, right? You trick them into installing yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or authorizing it. Wow. Yeah. We got so nerdy, Chad. Um, this is exciting. 
I'm yeah, so I know. Excited. That was I awesome. Need a drink after this. <laughs> after, <laughs> during. I just finished the one. I can't get up and get another one. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, don't same, go anywhere. Same here. Um, so now that's awesome, Chad. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm I'm glad to see that uh, we're making progress in this area, um, especially of exploitation and payload. So I definitely want to uh, kind of preemptive strike. I want to tell our listeners if you're interested in this, you should definitely help out. Phil and Chad, because them and the three other people who were doing this need help. But now, Phil, um, <laughs> you and, and not only for their mental state, but they need assistance. They need assistance, right? They need yes. some interns. Yeah, um, I have a, I have a question, Paul. Go I'm ahead, just, Jeff. I have to ask that um, with with some of the work that you're doing, what's been IBM's response? Are they are they hostile towards you, mm. or is it more of a? Um, yeah, we'll tolerate you. Or what, what's 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 the kind of response and, and relationship you have with IBM? So, so I can I've been doing this for about three years now. My first talk was like at B side in 2012, and it wasn't until March of this year that I actually spoke to anyone who admitted they worked at IBM. Hmm. I may have spoken to someone from IBM before, but they did not tell me they were with IBM. There was just there there was this sort of like. I don't know. I was worried that they were going to come after me. And I don't know if they, I do know. So I gave a keynote at share share is a large mainframe conference and they invited me to give a keynote. And I know there were people from both the large vendors and IBM saying, we don't want this guy to give a keynote because he's, he's basically crapping all over our, our beloved platform. He's a hacker. Why are you letting a hacker present at our conference? Damn it. That's exactly it. Like, like people were referring to like, Oh, are you going to go watch that hacker talk tomorrow morning? Like, <laughs> That kind of stuff. And so, and, and so there was this big disconnect. But, but once I spoke there, it sort of opened the doors in terms of, of speaking with not just IBM, but, but also the other large vendors in the space where, where they were like, oh, he, it's not that bad. It's not that scary. They just want to make it better. They don't, they're not coming after us and coming after our money. They care about the platform as much as we do. Mm. They're just coming at it from a different space. Mm-hmm. And so, so, so in my experience, at least with, with IBM specifically, there's definitely a lot of love. Um, they, they've definitely opened their arms. They haven't, I get worried sometimes that they're just going to shut me down, to be honest. I get worried that they're just going to come out and say, all right, you've done enough. We're going to cease and desist because whatever. Because they, they have a lot of lawyers and they could certainly do that. Yeah, you know. And so, I, so in fact, Chad can say right before the DEF CON talk, I was talking to him and I'm like, hey, I don't know about this and... And I'm worried about that and, and all this kind of stuff. And then I got over it and gave, I didn't cut anything. But, but there's definitely the worry. Mm. But, but all I've seen so far is they've been really accepting. Oh, that's good. Mm. Now, that's Phil, my- talk, talk about some of the things you've done. Uh, we're getting towards the end here. But uh, talk about some of the things that you've done with Nmap specifically. Um, all right. I want to hear about the things. And I want to hear if they've adopted everything that, um, that you've written. So, so for Nmap. I've written a TN3270 emulator in Lua, which was a massive under, which was a, just a pain in the ass, really. It was just like... Yeah. Lua's not... <laughs> no, I mean, it's not horrible, but... It's not terrible, but I'm not a Lua programmer, and I'm using examples, and I'm like, what, what does this hashtag mean? I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> so, and there's no concept of... Anyways... It's great. No, no concept of a lot of things. Like the language wants to take care of everything for you. Yeah, no, I yes, get it. Yeah. yeah, I get it. So, and so, but I did that. I wrote that. And because I wrote that, that opened up a, all I was doing. Initially, all I was doing was I wanted to scan a machine and have Nmap show me the pretty picture of a yes. mainframe, right? Because right. to me, that's the banner of a mainframe. It's right? like the that's MOTD the in Linux, but the yeah. uh, equivalent in ZOS, which you have to understand how it's talk TN3270 to get that to come back. Exactly. And so that started, that's what, that's what started, and it turned into three weeks of me doing stuff. And then once I wrote that, it was trivial for me to add things like, if you know what Kix is, Kix enumeration. So there's a Kix transaction ID enumeration script. There's an application ID enumeration script, user ID enumeration script, user ID brute forcing. You can do application fuzzing now. So you know those like you get those green screen applications, you can connect to them and you can actually fuzz them using Nmap and it's it's trivial to write since there's a library that exists now. You can do all this kind of fun stuff with that because of all the scripts. I'm constantly writing more scripts as I encounter things like, oh, it'd be nice if I could do X. Okay, I'll just quickly write a Nmap script to do that. Is it in <coughs> sorry in that? So Phil, all that hinges really on the TN thirty two seventy emulator, right? 
Yes. Mm. Yeah. And so all, all that's keeping it from being in the Nmap library right now is the time to go through and clean up the code and make it nice so that it can be a library and meet. I mean, I'm not a, a developer by any means. This, it was, you know, I needed the tool, so I wrote it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it just, I'm a little nervous to submit it because the code's not great. In fact, we were, we were going through another tool I wrote, and I found, like, debugging calls that were still in it on the DEF CON CD, things like, what the hell does this do? And then it echoes out some <laughs> value. No idea what it was doing. Right. So that, that's great. But that's all that's keeping it. To be honest, there's been interest from Nmap people to have it added. I, I have a, a macro in like VI that says, and it puts a comment above code that says, I have no idea what this does. I stole it from Google. Yeah, that's how I <laughs> Actually, I was joking because I also wrote a TN3270 emulator in Python as well because I was like, well, I did it in Lua. Let's do one in Python. Right. And, uh, and I joke with people. I say, once Google figures out how to write an AI that you can say, I want to do this in Python, and then it goes to Stack Overflow and asks all the questions you would need and then it copy and paste that code and writes the yes. application for you. Because that's all I'm doing. And then I was <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Holy crap. That's how I program. Google, that's, that's get awesome. on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? And it was, the how next, do I the do this in the, Python? The, and you're right. You get Stack Overflow. The and there's a little the snippet next, of code. The, and next like, new beta, the next new beta software from Google. Yes. I mean, because they dropped Google code. So what, I mean, what's their <laughs> next big really programming funny. thing? So what's in store next for mainframe security? You said you talked to some people from IBM. Like what's – you've got these tools. We've got exploits. We've got scanning capabilities now. Some stuff is happening in the Metasploit framework, I would imagine. I heard someone mention. I think it was Chad. Yep. yep. So like what, what comes next? Chad, you can, you can go first here. Well, I mean, so awareness, right, is one. So we're doing stuff like this, talks, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, because we, we want to both – it's a little bit carrot, a little bit of stick, right? I want to encourage the Uber nerds out there. They're looking for something different that hasn't been like written to death about or blogged to death about or, you know, like everybody isn't doing. So like, you want to go out and get, try something new. And a little bit of a stick, like, hey, maybe you like your, I don't know, economy, right? So maybe you want to secure these things um, and, and doing that. And, and, the, and the other thing is like, you know, once I get a, a – I'm going to stop with the tools and then start digging into – um, really looking for lots of, of of problems, but before I started doing that, I wanted to have like a basic set of like Metasploit and other tools and a basic really good disassembler debugger kind of thing, and then it's going to be like okay, let's start seeing like what we can find because it might not be IBM's code, but this thing runs a ton of third party code. Not to mention all the stuff that's been written from your grandfather's grandfather that's still on there. Uh, so, you know, that as sure as we're sitting here, there are, there are problems waiting to be found. I just want to have the right tools before I go, you know, before we go looking for a lot of that stuff. Yeah, I think, I think for me, it's, it's the same. Like a lot of the tools I wrote came out of necessity. So it's, it's still maybe polishing some of the tools and then really continuing to spread the word. I know I've been pushing really hard for there to be a mainframe capture the flag anywhere. I think that would, that would be a lot of fun for for everyone involved, especially the people who uh, who do it. Uh oh, and then um, and then Paul made an ass of himself. I was just hoping. I was hoping I didn't burn a hole through my shorts. That's what yeah. I was. It was it was right after. I, I think it was maybe it was Phil. He said, "Polish my tool," and Paul made an ass of himself. I know. I, I, and then the, as soon as he said that, the ash fell in my lap and burned almost a burned a hole in my shorts. I'm good though. Oh, nice. I'm sorry. Continue. I'm good. No, it's fine. It's it's more just about about you know. Once the tool sets are good, like I'm doing pen tests, but I'm still <clears throat> upgrading tools. But I've heard some horror stories of people who own mainframes and have asked for pen tests and gotten, here's our Nessus scan. <laughs> so, you know, I want to write some, some Nessus modules that will support here. If you see this, at least you know what NJE is and why you shouldn't have access to it, that kind of stuff. And then um, I've been really pushing hard for there to be a capture the flag event on, on this platform. I think that would be both from a, just a personal interest to see how it goes but also to see people at like a hacker convention doing capture the flag and going like, what the hell is this? How do nice. I do any, how can I get these points? You know, or a hack this system, right? Like just put it out there, phone, yeah. lock it up and say, look, if you can get in and get it, we'll give you a, you know, give you a free pony, whatever. It'd be really cool if you could 
bring an actual mainframe to the conference. Now, too. the Whiskey yeah. Hacker, the Whiskey Pirate crew, mm-hmm. they had one of the suites. They were one of the call for suites, and they had several smaller mainframe devices in their suite. Yep. They had, I know they had a Unix one. I can't remember what it was. And I, I don't know if they had an AS400. Yeah, those, those you could probably find on yeah. you know, Craigslist yeah. and eBay. Because they're a little, they're less expensive than a, a mainframe that would run ZOS, right? Yeah, yeah. You don't need, you don't, th- those are, those are little mid range things. Yeah. Still expensive, but yeah, you can find them yeah. cheaper, yeah. right? Then there was, yep. what was the one from, was it Silicon Graphics that had the one that had like the, the SGI, it was like a seat? What was that one? Was that an SGI? About, right? What is it? The a cray. cray? Was it a cray that had yeah, like a seat you could sit in? Crazy computer, yeah. Yeah. That had like the leather seats over top of the coolant. Yeah. Nice. And uh, my iPhone probably has more processing power than that does now. I don't know. Is that really true? Someone's writing a cray emulator. Like there's there's emulators that exist for cray and stuff like that too. Nice. You'll be running it on your Raspberry Pi by the end of the month, probably. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At double speed. Right. Awesome. All right. Now the important questions are the five questions with Security Weekly. So I will ask a question of Chad, and then Phil will answer the same question, and then I'll go to Phil. And then Okay, so you guys ready? Yeah, sure. we get the fun okay. part. I'll start with Chad. Three words to describe yourself. Right now, um, tired, hungry, and thirsty. Phil? Oh, nerds. Uh, cold, <laughs> excited, Whoa. and... Nipples. <laughs> what was the last... Yeah, what, what he said. Nipples. Oh. Gotcha. <laughs> nipples. Cold, excited, and nipples. Yeah. Phil, yeah. Th- uh, if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? You know, since I've been on last time, I've been, I've been rethinking my answer. I'm going to go with an old teletype printer. Ooh, yes. nice. Those are heavy. Yeah. Chad? I was thinking salt. Salt. Wow. Nice. Right. If you, Chad, if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? What not to do. Phil? The Incredibly Boring Adventures of a Mainframe Hacker. <laughs> Phil, in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Definitely second. Chad? I, I always first. Yes, yeah, so you guys make a great <laughs> like a couple. Pair. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, choose two celebrities to be your parents. Alive yeah, or dead. I'm gonna go with Britney Spears and John McAfee. <laughs> oh damn, McAfee's a good one. I like all that. sorts of crazy up in that house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was bored as a child, so no more. He would never be bored. Right. Phil, I don't. Is is he a celebrity? So Chris Nickerson and Danny Tanner. <laughs> oh, uh, nice. 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 Uh, I'm gonna, I want like a soft and like a hard parent. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> That's. <laughs> No, no, wait, which one is the hard one? You know what? Your, it's your answer, Phil. We're in no position to judge. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. None whatsoever. <laughs> New normal here. That's, uh... now, now, the question is Chris Nickerson or DJ Slurp? Check, check. Nickerson. Okay. Just because I just watched the I Am the Calvary talk where he chewed out the audience. So, uh... Nice. Um, so you can find all of the slides, video, and links to the GitHub repositories where I'm assuming you have, uh, are the uh, exploitation stuff in the Nmap scripts out there? Mm-hmm. Okay, so both yep. those things are out there at mainframe767.tumblr.com. And many other places. I think uh, bigendiansmalls.com, that's Chad's blog. And then on GitHub, if you just go to zsec390, like Z spelled Z-E-D, sec390, you'll find all the code and stuff. Nice. Yes. Yeah, that's the, you, it's the only non-porn Tumblr thing I subscribe to. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my Tumblr is just '90s VHS nostalgia. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's pretty cool, actually. You, you should go check it out. What is this Tumblr? Oh, that's like the thing that the kids are using nowadays. Right. It is. Oh yeah. no, that's like Kick and. No Tumblr is there's a lot of the, the porn chat. Certain. We'll talk yeah. after the show. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll educate you. Wow, wow. You, wait, you're going to educate me on the internet? On something new about the internet. <laughs> Usually it's you, like, check out this new meme because it's really cool. And I'm like, what? What is It's a frog. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what? You said it right. It's meme. It's meme. <laughs> it's meme. I said it right. See, I'm learning. I'm learning. Um, we also have a, uh, a mailing list. So people of like minded or who's interested can t- discuss nice. it. It's at bit.ly slash mf dash pen. Excellent. 
So. Come join all five of us on there. And, nice. uh, and they have a Pinterest account, too, which is kind of nice. That's right. How to decorate your mainframe. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, Phil and Chad, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. Yes, thanks for having us. Thanks, Paul. Thanks Sweet. for having us. Yes. Uh, and with that, we can take a short break, come back, and talk about the stories for this week with none other than Mr. Michael Santarcangelo. Yay. Yay. Thirsty. Drinks. <laughs> 